Okay, well, welcome everybody to the uh, uh, Undergraduate Research Symposium. We have a nice session uh, for, for you today. Um, we have several speakers who are gonna tell us about their research. And we're gonna go in the order on the um, agenda that was published. And first is Michaela Kapage and Jacob Evarts, who are gonna talk about hunting for prions, propagating putative prion states in budding yeast. So I'm gonna let them take it away. They're gonna give you a, an overview of their poster presentation, uh, five minutes, and then we'll have time for question and answers. All right, thank you. Um, so yeah, my name is Michaela Kupage. Um, along with Jacob Evarts, we are in the Garcia Lab in the Institute of Molecular Biology. And I'll let um, Jacob start us off. Hello, everyone. I just did the exact thing that uh, David did not want me to do. Uh, my name is Jacob Everts, uh, and we're going to talk a little about prions today. So it's well established that stress conditions can negatively affect how yeast cells grow and propagate. So Michaela and I's work has really aimed at illuminating some of the mechanisms that these cells uh, use to kind of deal with these problems. Um, and in particular, we're looking at what are called prion proteins. So prion proteins are a class of epigenetic mechanisms. Um, so they result in phenotypic changes without changes in DNA. Um, and really, if you simplify a prion down to its base level, every protein is made by folding a one-dimensional sequence of amino acids, or excuse me, a two-dimensional sequence of amino acids. And you fold them into kind of these complex three-dimensional structures. Um, and every protein kind of has like a default, normal, or naive uh, conformation that it likes to be in. And all a prion is, is a different way of folding that same amino acid sequence. Um, and because a protein's shape is very closely tied to a protein's function, when you change the shape of these proteins, you're also liable to change the function of these proteins. So for this project, um, previous uh, experiments in the Garcia lab have um, kind of uh, produced a list of six strains that we uh, suspect contain a prion conformation of six um, RNA modifying enzymes. Those enzymes are ABD1, SET1, PPM2, PUS4, PUS6, and TRM5. So this project um, took those strains that we think might have a prion and tested to see if they exhibit um, certain inheritance patterns or characteristics that are consistent with prion proteins. So if we can show that these strains show the same inheritance patterns as strains that contain known prion proteins, we're one step closer to being able to say that these strains are resistant to chemical stressors because they contain a prion conformation um, of this underlying enzyme. Yeah, so the, the protocol right now for deterring if a yeast cell has prions present um, is a bit complicated. So we, for these experiments, actually used um, the growth phenotype as a proxy for whether or not these strains contain uh, a prion protein. So there's kind of three steps to doing this. So first, we propagated and isolated the candidate strains that we were interested in testing. Uh, we then performed growth assays on these strains, and we finally analyzed these strains and their growth dynamics against control strains that we knew did not have prions as kind of a baseline level. Uh, this diagram here um, shows kind of the two different paths for inheritance patterns that traits could have. If the trait is caused by an underlying genetic mutation, um, it follows the path in uh, pink and yellow, where the meiotic offspring will inherit this uh, phenotype in a two to two pattern. Um, whereas prions shown all in pink there um, will inherit the trait. It'll always be dominant in the diploid background and the trait will inherit in a four to zero inheritance pattern or in a three to one inheritance pattern because the trait, um, the underlying mechanism behind that trait is protein based, not based on the um, nucleic acid sequence. And so um, when we perform these experiments, we're comparing the inheritance pattern um, against kind of these two options to see which category they sort into. Um, so if we think about why these inheritance patterns kind of come about, again, prions are just proteins that are folded in a different way. So they exist in the cytoplasm. They're what we call cytoplasmic elements. Um, and so when a cell divides, all of the daughter cells get some of the original cytoplasm and thus receive all of the prions. 
Um, and this unique pattern of inheritance makes it really easy to screen for the presence of prions by testing for both the diploid dominance um, and for non-Mendelian inheritance in the child cells. Um, and so we found that five of our six candidate proteins had strains that were dominant in a diploid background. Um, so again, the diploid always inherited the phenotype. And these same five strains showed four, zero, or three, one inheritance in the progeny. Whereas again, a two, two inheritance would suggest a genetic phenotype. Um, these phenotypes all appeared to be prionic or at least based in some cytoplasmic element. Um, the only protein that we tested that did not show these phenotypes was PPM2, um, which does not appear to have prions present. Um, so again, to kind of summarize and move to conclusions, uh, the goal of this experiment was to compare the inheritance patterns for six strains with putative prions and to compare their patterns against known prion states. Uh, we found that five of our six candidate strains um, expressed inheritance patterns consistent with prions, both the dominance in the diploid background and non-Mendelian non inheritance. Um, the next step of this project is to continue to test these strains to see if they show other hallmarks of uh, prion-like behavior. So if the phenotype, um, the trait is dependent on the presence of the underlying protein, um, if it inherits through the cytoplasm alone without inheriting, um, without the presence of the nucleus, um, if, they, uh, if the proteins um, aggregate in a different way in the cells, these are all kind of different hallmarks um, that we'll be testing these strains for in the future. And the findings presented here and from future experiments will add to our understanding of the role of prions um, as a form of inheritance, uh, kind of expanding our understanding of prions and how prevalent they are, but also really illuminates another um, epigenetic mechanism in, in cellular responses to stress. And that's what we yeah. got. We would also like to briefly thank uh, members like our CEO lab for their support in this project, um, as well as several sources of funding that were really vital in kind of making this all come together. Um, including from the VPRI, Summer Fellowship, um, the NIH, as well as the Night Campus. And thank you all for listening. Okay, great. Very good. Um, any questions from the other speakers or from the attendees? I, I have a question. I'll start off. I just... Um, I don't know much about prions. Could you tell me how do, how do they become, how are they infectious? How do they uh, generate more prions if not through uh, protein generation through genetic expression? Do they cause other proteins to misfold through their presence or what, what happens? I can talk about this one if you'd like, Michaela. Um, so yeah, so you're absolutely correct. So there's some like base population of these like of like a normal protein in a cell. Um, and once you kind of get the first prion to come about to form, this can be either through spontaneous generation. Um, there's a lot of work to show that exposure to acute stress increases the likelihood that you get these flips. You can also um, overexpress that protein, which is what we did to increase the chance of one of the proteins flipping to its prion state. But you're absolutely correct. Once you have one of these proteins flip, um, kind of an interesting thing about prions is that they self-template. Um, they're kind of self-exciting. So once you get one, it's able to kind of recruit and flip other proteins of the same type into their prion states. And so you really get this cascade, this domino effect, where once one protein flips, uh, more and more begin to flip throughout the entire cell um, until the majority of the cell's protein population of that type is in its prion state. And I think importantly too, prions are um, an equally stable folding conformation. So proteins when they fold enter this stable state that then they don't leave from typically. And prions are also stable um, and uh, kind of consistent, but they're just a different way of folding. And I think that there's still also a lot of research into the kinematics of why a protein can kind of unfold and refold back to another state. Any other questions? Okay, well, if not, thank you very much. And we're going to move on now to uh, talk by Isabel Cullen, active 
olfactometer responses in head fixed mice. All right, let me share my screen. So hello, everybody. My name is Isabel Cullen. Um, I'm a member of the SMEAR lab here at the University of Oregon in the um, Institute of Neuroscience. And today we're going to talk about um, olfactomotor responses in head fixed mice. So our lab um, studies olfaction, essentially your sense of smell. Um, but we're combining our lab's interest of olfaction with my interest in autism spectrum disorder. So autism spectrum disorder is a neurodevelopmental condition characterized by deficits in communication and social skills, repetitive behaviors, and um, narrowed interests. So for example, my brother has autism and for him, um, this shows up by kind of like a lot of repetitive motions, like he'll shake his hands, repeat words to himself. Um, he has a very narrowed interest in cinematic photography and sound systems and electrical engineering, um, and also has trouble making eye contact um, with other people when you're talking to him. So why we're interested in this is a couple years ago, there was a paper done by the Sobel Lab um, over in Israel, which uh, Noam Sobel is a really famous olfaction um, researcher. And in the study and kind of this first figure, you can see over here, I can ooh, zoom in <laughs> on that. Um, so in this top figure, they exposed uh, typically developing children and children with autism to attractive and aversive odors. So an attractive odor would be like roses and an um, aversive odor in this case would be like rotten fruit. Um, so normally when you expose children or just any adult to a pleasant odor, they actually take in a larger inhalation. So essentially a larger volume, but with unpleasant odors or aversive odors as I refer to them, um, they actually take in a smaller uh, volume of odor. You can kind of see this in like that little first part of figure A. So they also tested this against um, children with autism and they think that children with autism, while they do um, smell pleasant odors and they're able to tell you this is pleasant, unpleasant, they don't modulate their sniffing when smelling aversive odors. So you can kind of see that in this slide right here. So the goal of our research is to look at this olfactor motor behavior um, and repeat expand upon the results from that. And we're looking at the neural mechanisms in this using mice. Um, so for our research, we'll be using wild type mice and um, CNTNAP2 mice, which are um, contactin associated protein like two mice. So these mice um, in generally in, you know, in science, we have actually like in the last 20 years or so, we've been able to um, find genes linked to autism spectrum disorder. It's a very highly genetic based condition um, with some twin studies showing like up to 90% of you know, congenital twins ha both having autism. Um, so we've been able to find some causal genes so we can actually knock that gene out in mice. So in doing that, we're using the CNT nap mice because this has actually been shown to have a lot of proteins within the olfactory bulb and also shown to have some deficits um, in olfaction and um, olfactory behavior. So we're using these two mice and currently the part we're at in our experiment is ex uh, just establishing, establishing in wild type mice, do they even perform a similar behavior to the typically developing children? Um, so how we do that is in this kind of middle section of methods. So we put the mouse in a box and we just expose them to um, different uh, odors. So ones that have been qualified as like attractive um, and aversive to mice. And then we also have a neutral odorant. So our attractive odorant is 2-phenylethanol, which is actually a component of roses. Um, and then for our aversive odor, we use 2-methylbutyric acid. And then for kind of a, a neutral odor, um, we're using alpha-pinene, which is something we've used in quite a few of our previous experiments. And then clean air is a uh, blank, just control. Um, and what we found so far, and I'll preface this by saying our results are only based on two mice, so we still have to a lot more data collection to do. Um, but this is some of the preliminary results that we found. So in this first figure here on the top left, um, we compared our the like first inhalation after odor exposure for each of the acid or for each of the odorants to see does the volume of um, the volume of air that they inhale upon first inhalation change um, with each odorant, which would be really similar to the the Sobel paper, which is what our experiment is based off of. And so far, we haven't found there isn't really any difference in terms of inhalation, um, like volume taken in. But mice actually sniff a lot faster than we do. Like ours is 
significantly slower than the mouse, where a mouse can sniff up to like 20 times in a really small time frame. Um, so in figure B, you can kind of see that there is a difference between some of the odors. Um, so we've actually found that uh, 2PE, which is 2-phenyl ethanol, does have a higher number of sniffs per second within the first 200 milliseconds after the first inhalation um, is actually a lot higher than some of the others. So like 2MB being our 2-methylbutyric, which is our aversive. So this is also really cool um, for us to go forward with. But like I've said, we have not found, or we've only studied this with two mice. So we still have quite a bit of um, more mice we need to run to make a definitive conclusion about this. Um, but we're also trying to look at the, like I said, the olfactory motor behaviors. So the olfactory motor behaviors are both obviously how you breathe in, but also the movement of the nose. Because when you um, do smell things, your nose is obviously moving. And um, we're studying to see like, does the nose move a lot in response to different, does it move up, does it move down, does it move back? Um, so we're also using a software called Deep Lab Cut to examine the um, positioning of the nose in response to each of the odors, which is kind of what this bottom part here um, is showing. So we have a side view and a bottom view to uh, show the lateral movement and the vertical movement. Um, but like I said, our re research is still ongoing and I'm, we'll be continuing this this summer, um, but some future directions, we're hoping to actually look at this in freely moving mice, because um, we've actually shown in this, in some of our preliminary research that the temporal dynamics of two cells in um, mice when they're head fixed and freely moving are completely different. Um, as you can kind of see in this little top part here, the gradients of the temporal firing is actually very different. Um, so we're hoping to move on to that in the near future and also um, eventually move on to repeating this with the CNT nap mice. Um, but if you hear a little bit more about this, I will be presenting tomorrow in a little bit more of an in-depth talk for my oral presentation. Um, but I really like to thank everybody on our team that has gone into creating this project. Um, Dorian, um, Avinash, Reese, and Jared, and Matt Samir for all of his guidance in this project. Okay, great, thanks. Um, anybody have any questions for Isabel? Don't be shy. You can also post questions in the Q&A section, which is typing. Isabel, when you say attractive versus uh, aversive odorants for mice, does that mean that they will approach or move away from those odorants? Is that what attractive versus aversive means? If yeah. You, if they weren't head fixed, they would move away or towards those odorants? Yeah, so like normal studies, like one of the big studies we used was um, a root pap uh, paper, uh, like root 2014. So they put the mice in a box and they'll expose them to different odorants. So they kind of base the attractive and aversiveness on the approach and um, movement away from the odor. So like an aversive odor, they'll be on the opposite side of the box, whereas an attractive odor, they're more likely to go towards it. Now, is there a good mouse model of autism? I think that really depends on who you ask. Um, there are, I actually worked on a study in high school um, called the SPARK study, and they work on identifying different causal genes of autism in like a national um, broad genetic study. And they, in that study alone, they've up, um, identified currently 50, but they suspect there could be upwards of 300 different genes um, that may be causal links to autism. So there's not just like one good model. I think it's definitely um, evolving. I know some of the big ones are definitely the CNT nap, Shank 3, um, uh, Fragile X knockout. So it, I think it really depends on who you ask, but there are certainly different models, but they all do show similar symptoms um, to, the, to autistic children. Any other questions? Well, let's uh, thank Isabel for her great presentation. A Zoom clap, it's very odd, but you know, that's what we have. <laughs> okay, so let's go on now to John Francis who is going to uh, speak on the relationship between cholinergic and neuroadrenergic activity.
and behavioral state. By the way, everybody, you can use your mouse on your poster. You can use your arrow to kind of point things out, I believe, since you're sharing your screen. So hi everyone, my name is John Francis and I'll be talking about the relationship between cholinergic and noradrenergic neuromodulatory activity and behavioral state in mice. Um, so an animal's ability to engage with a particular task is highly variable. Um, however, it's been previously shown that there's an optimal arousal state under which an animal can perform optimally. Um, arousal encompasses both brain state, which describes the physiological activity of the brain and behavioral state, which describes the observable behavioral patterns and movements of an animal. And moment to moment fluctuations in brain state and arousal ultimately influence an animal's ability to perform and engage in different perceptual tasks. Um, so these moment to moment fluctuations in behavioral state and arousal are influenced in part by various neuromodulatory systems within the brain. Um, so neuromodulators are neurons that modulate the activity of other neurons um, through the production and release of excitatory or inhibitory neurotransmitters. And varying activity within these neuromodulatory systems can then produce changes in an animal's cognition and sensory processing. Um, so the two neuromodulatory cell types in my project um, are cholinergic and noradrenergic neurons, which produce and release the neurotransmitters acetylcholine and noradrenaline respectively. Um, so cholinergic projections from nuclei in the basal forebrain and noradrenergic projections from nuclei in the locus ceruleus innervate to various target regions in the cortex. So given this background, I asked the following question. Um, what is the relationship between cholinergic and noradrenergic neuromodulatory activity and behavioral state with respect to diverse arousal and behavior dependent modes of neuromodulation? So to answer this question, we first had to visualize cholinergic and noradrenergic axon activity in awake mice. So GCAMP6S, a fluorescent calcium indicator, was injected into the basal forebrain of chat mice um, to allow for cholinergic axon visualization. And because of the transgenic gene expression of DBH mice, viral expression of GCAMP6S into the locus ceruleus of DBH mice um, was not required to see noradrenergic cortical activity. So following viral injections and cranial window implantations, um, simultaneous two photon calcium imaging and behavioral data acquisition um, was performed to directly compare axon activity to behavioral state. So after performing this two photon microscopy and behavioral recording, um, we show that ACH and NA neuromodulatory related axon fluorescence is closely related to moment to moment changes in behavioral state. Um, we also show that increases in whisker motion energy and walk velocity are both accompanied by increases in pupil diameter and by synchronous increases in both ACH and NA axon DF over F, um, or a measure of changing fluorescence across all regions of interest in the cortex. So to quantitatively determine the temporal differences in cross-correlation between neuromodulatory activity and behavior, um, the peak cross-correlation across all chat and DBH mice were averaged. Um, and we see that averaged ACH and NA max cross correlation with behavior um, preceded the onset of whisking and followed the onset of walking. Um, additionally, we see a statistically significant difference between these two values, um, indicating evidence of neuromodulatory, of varying neuromodulatory timescales um, across these two behavioral states. Um, so last to determine the relationship between axon to axon cross correlation and behavioral state, um, the max cross correlation between cholinergic axons um, for all chat and DBH mice were recorded for all periods of stillness, which means no whisking and no walking, um, only whisking and only walking. And for cholinergic data, we see that the max cross correlation between cholinergic axons was highest during stillness, intermediate during whisking, and lowest during walking. And um, there's also a statistically significant difference between these three groups, um, providing evidence of local specificity across behavioral states. Um, however, for the noradrenergic data, we see that the max cross correlation between noradrenergic axons did not differ by behavioral state. And so in the noradrenergic neuromodulatory system, we did not see this local specificity across behavioral states. Um, so future work on my project includes identifying the specific regions of interest um, from the cortex from which we were recording axons from. Um, so this would potentially provide us with a better understanding of the relationship between neuromodulation and multimodal cortical interactions. Um, additionally, future work also includes implementing other behavioral motifs into our analyses.
um, such as snout movement, facial twitching, grooming, and tail motion. Um, and this would provide us with a more comprehensive understanding of neuromodulatory signaling with respect to more varied behavioral and arousal states. And hopefully this would be more reflective of the mammalian brain. Um, so thank you all for listening and I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, great. Thank you, John. Any questions for John? I have a, a quick question for John. Yep. Um, I'm curious what you think, um, kind of like some of the translatable aspects of this experiment are, even, even like, you know, way down the line, if you're just kind of doing some wild speculation on, on how this could eventually translate to human health or if there is a place for it in human health, um, or if that's not really the end goal of some of this research, I'm curious what you think um, some of the long-term implications of this work are. Right, so the big question is how, how does the brain impact behavior? Um, how does what's going on neurologically impact observable patterns that, of behavior that we as humans do? Um, and I think you know, this study being done in mice um, provides us a good background or starting point um, being done in a mammalian system um, and being able to understand the relationship between these different um, you know, behaviors and specific neural circuitry within the brain. Um, and so I think this just reveals a little bit more about how complex neural circuitry in the brain um, can sort of influence our ability to do different day-to-day -day tasks. Um, and obviously the, in humans, they would be more complex than whisking or walking, um, but yeah. Any other questions? So to follow up on Jacob's question, um, you said there's a relationship and, you know, this is kind of unfair because this is from my lab, so I know this work. <laughs> uh, uh, there's a relationship between pupil diameter, brain state, performance, and neuromodulation. So if given that, would you be able to maybe think of an application in a, in a person with, let's say, ADHD or autism or schizophrenia or lots of different disorders what, that you could apply easily to maybe look at the, what might be going on in their, in their brain if they can't focus? Right. I think that, um, you know, since we know that there is this relationship between neuromodulatory activity and behavior, perhaps by either stimulating or inhibiting these different neuromodulatory nuclei in the central nervous system, we can um, reach this optimal arousal state as seen in the Yerkes and Dotson curve here. Um, and one thing that we do study in lab is um, vagus nerve stimulation. Um, we're exploring that as a potential application um, of stimulating these different, you know, neuromodulatory nuclei um, to see how that impacts behavior. So I think that's the, the biggest application that comes to mind. Any other questions? All right, well, let's, uh, let's thank John for his uh, excellent presentation. And we're going to move on now to uh, Julia Lowe, who's going to talk to us about investigating the mechanism of DNA repair in C. elegans. Hi, everyone. So my name is Julia Lowe. And this past summer, I worked on quantifying DNA damage in chromosome structure mutants. So meiosis is a specialized cell division that results in haploid sperm and eggs. Meiosis is characterized by one round of DNA replication followed by two rounds of cell division. And C. elegans are a great model organism for studying meiosis and imaging due to their organization of the germline as well as their transparent nature, which allowed me to see all the stages of meiosis in order. C. elegans also have a marker for DNA damage in early and late meiosis. I looked specifically at early meiosis and late meiosis because that is where DNA damage is induced and repaired respectively. DNA is organized into chromatin on the chromosomes and chromatin is tightly coiled DNA around histone proteins, all making up a nucleosome. 
There is heterochromatin and euchromatin. In heterochromatin, DNA is highly compacted and inaccessible to many other proteins, while euchromatin has a more open nature. There are different marks that can define heterochromatin versus euchromatin. For example, H3K9 ME2 is a heterochromatic mark. And so this means that there were two methyl groups added to histone 3. The effects of chromatin states and loss of chromatin marks on DNA damage repair and induction are not currently understood. In the germline, we know that developing sperm and eggs purposefully induce DNA damage in early stages of meiosis, and that this damage is typically repaired in late meiosis. So using a marker for DNA damage, I wanted to observe how changes in the DNA damage and repair program at these stages of meiosis in a new context where the organization of the DNA has been altered. And so this led me to my research question, how does the loss of a specific heterochromatic mark H3K9 ME2 affect the DNA repair system? And to look at this, to answer this question, I looked at a MET2 null mutant, which lacks the H3K9 ME2 mark, but still produces haploid sperm and eggs, allowing me to assess the lack of this mark's effect on DNA damage repair and induction. My lab mentor took pictures of germlines on a microscope, and I used Amaris to create surfaces out of that DNA. I then was able to create spots out of the DNA damage in order to quantify them. And then this allowed me to determine how much DNA damage was associated with each nucleus during early and late meiosis. So what you're seeing in this central panel is immunofluorescence images showing DNA and DNA damage in oocyte nuclei. I looked at early meiosis because that is where DNA damage is induced and late meiosis because that is where DNA damage is repaired. The blue represents DNA and the yellow represents the DNA damage. Qualitatively, my data shows that there is more DNA damage induced in the wild type than the MET2 mutant. And then in late meiosis, it seems to me that there is more of an equal amount of DNA damage in the MET2 and wild type worm. The graph to my right represents data from 10 gonads, five wild type and five MET2. The white is representative of the MET2 mutant while the black represents the wild type. And then the green outline signifies early meiosis and the purple signifies late meiosis. And then the Y axis is the amount of DNA damage per nucleus. So in this graph, we can see that the MET2 mutant starts out with less average DNA damage per nucleus. To me, this indicates that the presence of the H3K9 ME2 mark is important in some way for the induction of DNA damage. However, in late meiosis, where breaks are repaired, the MET2 mutant seems unaffected, indicating normal repair mechanisms even in the absence of H3K9 ME2. And you can see this on the right side of the graph where the average are about the same at the end of meiosis. In conclusion, the MET2 mutant induces less DNA damage in early meiosis than the wild type worm. However, the MET2 and wild type have the same average DNA damage per nuclei in late meiosis. This all leads me to the conclusion that the repair system is unaffected by the lack of H3K9 ME2, but important for the induction of DNA damage. Some future directions for my research would be repeating the study with a higher sample size, creating surfaces out of the H3K9 ME2 marks, looking at DNA damage in other chromatin mutants, or looking at other chromatin marks like H3K9 ME3. Thank you guys so much for listening today and a special thank you to my mentor, Zach Bush and Diana Labuda for being the primary mentor for everyone in my lab, as well as all my fellow Labuda lab members for their support. I would also like to thank the fire coordinators and all the other funding received for this project. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Julia? I have a question. Um, wonderful presentation, by the way. Um, so I'm curious how you were able to quantify um, the damage. I've done a similar project before um, for a different lab where we hand counted like all uh, from the 3D rendered images. So I'm curious like how you did that. Did you use coding software or was this like hand counted? Yeah, so this was all done on Amaris, which is like a 3D imaging software basically. And the DNA damage was um, like tracked through RAD51. And RAD51 is basically a protein that can bind intermediate recombination structures. So it basically only looks at um, damage that is destined for repair by recombination. 
And then so in Amaris, we were able to use that RAD51 data in order to make those the DNA damage spots. And then that software is able to count it for us if it's associated with a nuclei, if that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, that does, thank you. Any other questions? I have a question. Since I don't do this kind of work, I'm uh, very curious. When you say DNA damage, do you mean do you mean breaks? Is that what you mean? Is yes, that, exactly. And, and how do you label a break? How do you how do you make it show up on the on the assay? Uh, actually, so honestly, I never got to work in the lab because I was fully remote. So I was I was only looking at the pictures after they were taken and like edited. So honestly, I don't know that, but yes, they, the DNA damage is representative of double strand breaks. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Well, let's thank Julia for an excellent presentation. Thank you. And now uh, Tylee Morris is going to talk about the effects of optogenetic suppression of gap detection in mice. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Tilly Morris. And through my research in the Weir Lab, which is in the Institute of Neuroscience here at UO, I've been studying the effect of optogenetic suppression of gap detection in mice. In the big picture, this research relates to speech processing, which is the part of hearing that turns the sounds you hear into electrical signals your brain can understand. Many people have deficits in speech processing. These deficits happen with normal aging and with diseases like Alzheimer's. One aspect contributing to speech processing deficits is having deficits in detecting the gaps in between words, syllables, and phonemes. As I'm talking right now, your brain is quickly detecting the brief gaps in between the words and syllables that I'm using, which allows you to understand what I'm saying. The ability to process brief gaps is known as gap detection. Since gaps play such a huge role in speech processing, the neuronal circuits used in gap detection are a simplified model of the neuronal circuits used in speech processing. For this experiment, we were manipulating the gap detection ability of mice. We have already shown that mice can perform gap detection, meaning they can detect gaps in background sound. And now we're trying to manipulate that gap detection ability by targeting the activity of neurons in an auditory cortex. If we can successfully manipulate this gap detection ability, then it will suggest that the neurons in auditory cortex are indeed responsible for gap detection. Understanding more about which neurons are used for gap detection will tell us more about the pathways used for speech processing and understanding these pathways can help provide potential remedies for people with speech processing deficits. To accomplish this, we had mice perform a behavioral task called a choice task. This entails the mouse going into a box that has three ports and constant background white noise playing. You can see the setup for this choice task in the lower left corner. For each trial, there is a gap in this background sound or there is no gap and the mice have to respond based on what they hear. If there is a gap, they will get rewarded by going to the left port and if there's no gap, they will get rewarded by going to the right port. The mice we use to do this choice task are optogenetic mice which means they have genes that are influenced by light. These specific mice have inhibitory optogenetic genes, which means that the activity of their cells is turned off when the cells are exposed to light. The mice have fibers implanted in their brains that hover just over auditory cortex so that we can shine light on the neurons in auditory cortex. You can see this setup in the middle, in the images in the middle here. In theory, since the light inhibits neuronal activity of these mice, when the light is on, it should cause the mice to respond to the stimulus as if there is no gap, even when there is a gap. This should make the mice's gap detection ability get worse. The data we got from this experiment was inconclusive. In this graph in the middle, um, gap duration is on the x-axis and the percent of times the mice went to the left, so the percent of times they detected gaps is on the y-axis. The different colors represent different laser strengths. As you can see in the graph, the mice went to the left port about 40% of the time, regardless of the length of the gap they heard. For reference, 
For the longest gap durations, we expected to see the mice going to the left for almost 100% of the time, because this is when it's most obvious that there is a gap and the mice get rewarded from the left when there is a gap. And then on the other side of it, for the shortest gap duration of zero milliseconds, when it's most obvious that there is no gap, we expected to, to see the mice go to the left port close to 0% of the time. This bias that they're showing indicates that the mice were not paying attention to the stimulus. And this graph is only from one of the mice. There were 18 total, but all of them showed the same trend of having a very strong bias towards either the left or right port. This bias and lack of gap detection could mean that mice cannot perform gap detection, but we know from other experiments that they can indeed do gap detection. So we think that it's a problem with the experiment and we have an idea of what it could be because when these mice were learning the choice task, there was a bug with the software that caused the sound to turn off. And since there was no sound, there was no stimulus and the mice learned that if they pick one port to go to repeatedly, they will eventually get their water reward. So even though we've fixed this bug and tried to reteach them the task, they're still not performing gap detection, which means that they've given up and learned that they will still get rewarded without paying attention to the gaps. So we will need to redo these trials in order to get conclusive data. Once we redo these trials, if we're able to manipulate gap detection and confirm, the, and confirm this part of the pathway for speech processing, this knowledge could have the potential to help improve the quality of life of people living with speech processing deficits. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, yeah, open to questions now. Thank you very much. Any questions? Um, I have a question about the um, to the forced choice task. So you gave a really good explanation of it, um, but I don't work with mice, so it like I don't know. I think it's very cool that you can get mice to do anything. Um, so if there is a gap in the background sound, they go to the left port and get a reward. And if there was no gap, then they go to the right. How do you interpret if they just don't? move if they just like stay in the middle? Does that just like become like a null test or does that factor into your analysis in some way? Yeah, so the middle port is actually used and this isn't like a natural task for the mice. They have to learn this task. So it starts with um, like it starts with them first just learning that the ports mean water. So like they learn that they will get water from the ports. And then the next step is that they learn that they need to request rewards. So they learn that they need to go to the middle port first and then they'll get like a reward from either the left or right. And then we start adding in the gaps. And so first we add in like only really long gaps and no gap. And then once they get the hang of that, we add in like the shorter gap durations to make it more complicated. So the middle gap, they always go to the middle first to start a trial. And then because it's a forced choice task, what that means is like, it's not a go, no go kind of task. Like regardless of the stimulus, they have to go to the left or the right. Um, yeah, so they there will always be either a left or right response um, based on the stimulus. Does that answer your question, Michaela? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Any other questions? I believe there's one in the, the Q&A. Yeah, OK, yeah. so yeah, I see it. Thank you. Um, so a possible next step is to, um, instead of just using gaps to like instead of using either a gap or no gap in the background sound for the choice task, remember I was saying how gaps are important because in speech there are gaps in between like syllables and phonemes. Um, so the next step would be to instead of just using like white noise and gaps to use actual speech sounds. And this would be to see the ability of how well mice can distinguish between phonemes. So like in between the phonemes B versus P, the way you can distinguish between those is by the length of the gap. So that, that would be the next step is to use actual, and that's called voice onset time because it's like 
dependent on how long the gap is versus like your voice onset. Okay, well, let's thank Julie for her excellent presentation. And um, let's go on now to Noah Putanari, who's going to talk about bacterial range expansion and the fissure speed, a discrepancy in nutrient rich media. Noah? Thank you for that introduction. Um, hi, so today I'm gonna to be talking about bacterial range expansion. And so before I get into that, I'm first gonna talk about how bacteria can actively navigate their environment. So bacteria move through their environment by two primary mechanisms. The first is growth dominated. So this is mainly controlled by cellular division. And the second is by actively moving through their environment. And this is called bacterial motility. So bacterial motility has been really well characterized in a lot of different species of bacteria for decades, but how it relates to large scale range expansion hasn't been super well studied. And so this is what my research is looking to um, sort of answer and like bridge this gap between large scale range expansion and microscopic motility. And so this is a super important research for um, in relation to human health because our guts are home to trillions of bacteria. And so understanding the dynamics and the mechanisms by which bacteria navigate environments that have many different kinds of nutrients available helps us to understand how bacteria are impacting our gut health, both physically, and there's been research done to show that bacteria also have a, in our guts, have a huge influence on our mental health as well. So um, understanding these connections is really important for human health. So some bacteria can exhibit chemotaxis, which allows them to sense chemical gradients in their environment, and they use this information to adjust their motility accordingly. So for example, in figure one here, you can see a bacteria is actively um, performing chemotaxis towards a nutrient source that will help it grow and divide. And um, range expansion sort of results from the macroscopic um, effects of chemotaxis. And so the Fisher speed is a theoretical prediction of the range expansion rate for um, a self-dividing organism such as a bacterium. But the Fisher speed is, it doesn't account for structure in the environment and it doesn't account for chemotaxis. So the main research question that I'm looking to answer is how, or does the predicted Fisher range expansion speed match the observed range expansion speed in nutrient rich conditions? So to answer this question, um, I use two different forms of imaging. The first is light sheet fluorescence microscopy, where we uh, image bacteria in gel using a laser illuminated focal plane. And these bacteria are fluorescent. So um, the laser that we use excites a fluorescent protein that's on their membranes. So we can track the bacteria as they're moving through the solution. And so figure three here shows what some of these trajectories look like. Um, for one of the species, Aramonis, that we study. And the second form of imaging that I use is macroscopic imaging. This is essentially, we have a plastic box with some bacterial plates inside of it, and we use a cell phone camera to image the plates for 20 hour um, intervals. And so figure four here shows three different panels of a single plate at three different time points. So the first panel shows the initial um, inoculation point and you essentially see nothing on this plate, but um, five hours later, we see that the bacterial inoculation point has grown and expanded on its plate a little bit. And then at seven hours, only two hours later, we see it's grown significantly more. And so this is the rate of this range expansion is what I am measuring. And so uh, moving up to results here, we see that figures five and six are data obtained from our light sheet data well, figure seven is data obtained from the swim plate images. And so figures five and six, when used in conjunction with per capita growth rate data, um, give us uh, the theoretical prediction for like the Fisher speed, um, which is the predicted range expansion rate. While figure seven gives us the observed range expansion rate. And by comparing these, we can see how accurate 
the Fisher speed is to um, observed range expansion rates in nutrient rich conditions. And figure eight here shows what this comparison looks like. This black line here shows the ideal correlation between the Fisher speed and the um, observed range expansion rate. And what we see for all six of the species of bacteria that we examine is they are all expanding much faster than what we would predict using the Fisher speed. And so this is indicating that there must be some mechanism driving range expansion in nutrient rich conditions for these bacteria. So this is essentially where my research is at right now. There was a paper that was published two years ago by Kramer et al in Nature that is a very similar study, but they did this just for E. coli, um, which is a very common model organism to use in chemotaxis studies. And so they found this sort of discrepancy with E. coli and they attributed this behavior to how chemotaxis um, causes bacteria to move in nutrient rich conditions. And so this is sort of laying the groundwork for the next steps in our experiment, where we're hoping to look at motility mutants and chemotaxis mutants and see if these mutants actually move more closely um, in line with the Fisher speed in um, in vitro observations. So um, after that, we hope to also look at how cellular motility is driving gut colonization in zebrafish. So all of these species that we examined are native to the zebrafish gut. So we are interested in learning how higher motility phenotypes might correspond to better gut colonization for zebrafish and whether or not the proximity of zebrafish affects um, how these bacteria are able to perform chemotaxis. So um, I would like to thank the Partha Sarathi lab, the Gilman lab, and the PERS program for their continued support on this project, and I'm open to any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions for Noah? How's the presentation, Noah? Um, I'm curious, I know it's, you know, still in the phases of looking at, you know, smaller organisms like zebrafish. Is there any plans in the future of the lab to potentially move this to um, mice? Because you had mentioned earlier that gut motility or and also uh, bacterial colonies within the gut do have um, effects on mental health. So I'm curious if there is future plans to also look at the behavioral impacts of um, gut colonization. Yeah, that's a that's a really great question. So my lab primarily deals with zebrafish, um, just because that's sort of the model system that we're more interested in and that we have a lot of experience with in my lab. So I don't think we have any plans to move to mice, but that would be a really interesting study to do in mice. Um, I know like just based off of the equipment equipment my lab has, that would definitely be difficult to do because um, yeah, none of us really have dealt with mice before. So um, yeah, but I think that would be really fascinating um, if somebody else did that or if we could move in that direction. Any other questions? Um, what are the hypotheses for the discrepancies? What are the possible mechanisms to explain it? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So um, initially, before we collected our data, we had um, sort of two ideas for what could be causing the discrepancy in either way. So if we observed a discrepancy where our observed rate was higher than the predicted rate, um, our guess was that chemotaxis could have been driving that because chemotaxis is the mechanism that allows bacteria to actively navigate their environment and sort of almost choose which direction they want to move in. Um, alternatively, if the bacteria were observed to expand slower than what the Fisher speed would predict, then we were assuming that that would be attributed to a structure of the environment. So um, the environment that we're looking at the bacteria in is a porous environment. So it's essentially like, you can almost imagine it like a jello. And so the bacteria moving through it, they there's holes in the environment, but there's also barriers. And so if the bacteria were expanding slower than what we predicted, that would have been attributed to them essentially running into walls and getting stuck. I wonder if you could do a similar study at the uh, cafeterias at U of O and student movement. I'm just joking. <laughs> Sorry. Um, thank you very much for that excellent presentation.
And uh, let's move on now to Haley Speed, who's uh, using fluorescence assays to explore. Let's see, how does it pronounce this? Kinurinine pathway regulation in neurospora. Hi, um, I am Haley. Everybody can hear me, right? Yeah, okay, awesome. Um, sorry if you can also hear some lawnmower noise outside, but hopefully it's not um, just very loud. Um, my project is titled Using Fluorescence Assays to Explore the Regulation of the Kynurinine Pathway in Neurospora crassa. Neurospora crassa is a fil filamentous fungus that our lab uses um, as a model organism. Specifically, I study the kynurinine pathway, which is a metabolic pathway that breaks down um, the, am the amino acid tryptophan into uh, fluorescent anthermelic acid. So this pathway is super easy to monitor because of the fact that the product is fluorescent. So um, if you can see over here in this figure, we have one culture that is fluorescing under UV light and one culture that is minimally fluorescent under UV light. Um, so this is an example of the pathway being active and the pathway being inactive. Um, so the reason why we're interested in this pathway in the first place is because several of the, gene, the genes that make the enzymes in the pathway are marked by H3K27 methylation, which is a specific type of histone methylation. So this is really similar to what Julia was talking about earlier. Um, so my research question is to try and identify additional unknown genes that affect the regulation of the kynurinine pathway. So if I do identify these genes, um, which I did, uh, some genes, uh, these could be affecting either the pathway itself specifically, which, be, which would be interesting in itself, or it could be affecting the H3K27 methylation, which would have greater chromatin control uh, implications. Um, so conveniently, my lab possesses a mutant collection called the FGSC Knockout Library, which is a collection of 13,000 uh, single knockout mutants. And so I have used this library to try and search for the mutants that I have isolated that affect the regulation of the pathway. So we're gonna zoom in on this methods figure. So I first conducted a primary screening of the collection by just um, copying each plate in the collection into another plate that contained liquid media with tryptophan. I would then inoculate this plate, grow it up, take some readings from it, um, that would help me determine which strains to move on to the secondary screening. Um, from the secondary screening, I would um, start cultures on solid medium of the strains that I was interested in. Then I would take some of the tissue from the solid medium, put it into liquid medium that contained tryptophan. Then I would take some media samples and um, scan this media for fluorescence data. Um, so now we're gonna zoom in on the primary screening section. Um, this section kind of shows how I would determine which strains would move on from the primary screening into the secondary screening. So the graph in front of you is actually an example of um, plate 16 out of 136 plates that were in the collection. Each of these little dots is a different strain on the plate. Um, on the y-axis, I have fluorescence, which is one of the readings I took from the plate. And on the x-axis, there is absorbance, which is actually a measure of how much tissue grew within each culture. So the strains that I would be interested in were the ones that grew enough to say something about them, but also still had abnormal fluorescence. So the pathway was being abnormally activated or inactivated. Um, for the secondary screening section, this section kind of shows the strains that I have isolated from the secondary screening. So the strains that I'm actually still studying. So there's 11 of them. And if you look at this figure, um, it shows you the fluorescence of these strains normalized to wild type. So wild type fluorescence is equal to one, which is this black line here. And you can see that my strains um, pretty much uh, replicably fluoresce either above, so hyperfluoresce or fluoresce below, or so hypofluoresce um, normal um, compared to wild type. So some other things that I have done um, so far is I have uh, confirmed all of the mutant knockouts by PCR since our lab didn't actually make this collection. 
And something that I'm doing right now is I am undergoing complementation of the knockouts in these 11 mutants, just to make sure that um, the knockouts themselves are actually causing the phenotypes and not some kind of background information on the strains. And then there's also some other future actions that I would like to take that just kind of revolve around the question of why these, these knockouts have the phenotypes and what the genes could actually be doing, I'm trying to wrap it back into the general chromatin control process. Um, I'd like to acknowledge everybody in my lab. Um, they're wonderful and amazing and super helpful and also the FIRE Fellowship for letting me kickstart this work last summer. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you very much. Any questions for Haley? I have a question. Um, awesome presentation, by the way. I love all the graphics. They're really well done. Um, so obviously this is relating to the breakdown of tryptophan. Is it specifically within mushrooms or like what is the, the larger idea that this project and the research is really getting at? Um, is it human related or more plant or animal related? Um, so the kynurenine pathway does exist in most eukaryotes. Um, it's a little bit different between um, like Neurospora uh, crassa, which I'm studying and other organisms, but the kynurenine pathway isn't really the, it's not really the main goal of this research to well understand the kynurenine pathway itself. The main goal is kind of to use this convenient pathway in order to, um, find more genes that affect H3 K27 methylation. So it's kind of trying to study more general chromatin control mechanisms instead of just the kynurenine pathway, even though I think the kynurenine pathway is really interesting in itself. Awesome, thanks. Any other questions for Haley? Okay, well, I want to uh, let's thank Haley for her excellent presentation. And um, we can open up now for general questions for any of the presentations. If anybody didn't get to ask their question before, we can uh, go back and, and revisit. If anybody has any questions. Well, if not, then um, I want to thank you all for giving your poster presentations and uh, participating today. And I'm really happy you're involved in doing research. I hope you're enjoying it, learning from it, and uh, I hope you stay in science. I've had an excellent career in science. I've really enjoyed it. It's great to be able to just walk into the lab one day and walk home later in the afternoon knowing something new. So I'm sorry to interrupt. I think there's actually um, a Q and A if you go down into the chat. Ah, did somebody ask a question? I think that was earlier from. Uh, from yeah, Tilly. that was earlier. We went through that one. Yeah. My bad. Hadn't marked it. Go on. Sorry. No problem, Ellie. Any have any, any more questions or comments? Well, thank you all again. Have a great day and uh, we'll see you all. Take care. Bye. All right, great session. Thank uh, you, Ellie.